to Inventing Our Future on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Brittany Zimmerman. And I'm your co-host, Richard Ha. And joining us today is our guest, Kevin McDonald. Today, we're going to do a deep dive into another C invention. Welcome to the show. How are you doing, Richard? Oh, pretty good. Boy, it's uh, raining cats and dogs, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here in Hilo, that seems to be the norm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and welcome, Kevin. Um, how are you doing? I, I'm doing well. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for asking. A little bit uh, of a drier area here in the geographic center of uh, of North America, sort of the uh, op and the anti Hawaii, as it were, in that uh, it's about as far away as you can get in the United States from an ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we're super glad to have you with us today. Um, our second C letter invention, we just had so many in the C category, we decided to, to do two, is <laughs> cement and concrete. So, Kevin, you may know a thing or two about cement and concrete. So, a little anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell us a bit about you, your relationship to cement and concrete, and anything else you feel like sharing right off the bat. Well, sure. I'm uh, my name's Kevin McDonald. I, I run a consulting engineering firm, uh, and I'm a professor at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, a stout in construction management, and, and where I teach concrete as a material, reinforced concrete design, and um, and heavy equipment operations. Um, I've been working in the concrete industry in, in various roles since the uh, since the late 1980s uh, in structural inspection and evaluation of existing structures, and uh, consulting uh, both in terms of uh, plastic and hardened concrete. In fact, I uh, spent 12 years manufacturing or involved in the manufacture of concrete. Uh, my previous employer would point out that I actually didn't ever did anything, but I told lots of people how they could do it much better. And then I went back into the consulting business. And uh, my uh, my education is in chemical engineering, which is sort of an odd place to find someone living with uh, in the concrete end of the cement and concrete industry. But um, I, I first got into it, uh, into concrete as a ex exploration of the corrosion of reinforcing steel in concrete. And of course, the uh, manufacturer of this synthetic stone, this concrete, is the largest chemical reaction that we run as human beings on Earth. And so it's the logical place for chemical engineers to be. Awesome. I mean, that is super exciting. And um, we have Richard with us. Um, Richard, do you have any major questions about cement and concrete or anything there related uh, to kick us off with Kevin? Yeah, maybe... Um... I, I'm just a farmer, yeah. So, um, isn't cement and concrete the same thing? <laughs> no, no, it's not. But it, it's a very common thing to look at. You know, concrete is a material that really defines our modern life, uh, and very it's very easy not to know anything about it. But uh, cement is to concrete as flour is to cake. It's one of the necessary ingredients, and the cement is the is a powdery material that will react with water, Portland cement is, to form a calcium silicate glue. And then it glues the rocks and other constituents of the <clears throat> concrete together. So the concrete is a material that is made of cement, but also includes mineral or synthetic aggregates or other materials that are bound together to form an artificial rock. And it's a fascinating material because it comes to the point where it is going to be used in the unfinished state. You can pour it into a mold, and whatever mold you pour it into, uh, it will eventually set and take on the shape of that mold. And so you can use concrete for making floors, for beams, for columns, for uh, all sorts of structures. So that, that that's the big difference between cement and concrete. The cement is a powder that mixed together with water becomes a glue. And it's a portion of, but not. It is, uh, in fact, a, a less than uh, about thirty percent of the concrete by volume is cement and water. The rest of it is minerals, uh, crushed rocks, um, that sort of thing. All, practically anything that uh, that you can find, and and unfortunately, not frequently enough, uh, recycled concrete. Yeah. 
you, you know, I'm curious about, um, I've heard that uh, the stuff you folks make is uh, last a longer, last longer, you can use it quicker. What, why, why, why is that? So, you know, concrete is a, is a very durable material. There are concrete structures uh, in, um, in Europe that are well over, uh, well over 2,500 years old, constructed by the Romans, who had a similar but not the same technology that we have. Um, you maize concrete is a material that relies not on Portland cement, but on a different cementitious binder. And one of the advantages of that cementitious binder is that it reacts very quickly and it gains strength very quickly. And then it fills in the spaces. Um, I, I hate the analogy, but if you can think of concrete as a hardened sponge, water can move through the concrete the same way it moves through the, the voids or the, the pores in a sponge. And the UMA material has a secondary reaction that uh, plugs those holes and makes the sponge much more watertight. And really, uh, water is the most destructive material on Earth, right? It's uh, amphoteric in that it will it will attack bases and acids. It uh, it is the universal solvent, so it will dissolve many things, and it can carry in chemicals that will cause problems in the concrete. Two of those chemicals that are very uh, serious for Hawaii are sulfates and chlorides, both of which are found in the seawater. Sulfate will attack the aluminate phases in the cement, causing an expansion and, and a general disintegration of the paste. Mm -hmm. And the chlorides will penetrate in and cause the corrosion, cause any reinforcing steel to corrode. And it's really searching through that particular corrosion problem is how I started getting involved in concrete because I was curious as to uh, how we could stop that electrochemistry uh, problem. In order to do that, you, to solve a corrosion problem, you need to understand the system where that corrosion is taking place. And after <laughs> looking at that, the system was much more interesting than just the corrosion problem. But that's uh, the, the reason that it is uh, stronger uh, at early ages and later ages and is more durable. Both have to do with the reduction of the amount of pores or space that's inside the hardened material. In certain instances, uh, your maize concrete does not have to use rebars. Is that is that true? Yes. Uh, concrete, that, which is designed, say it's continuously soil supported or it's always in an arching action um, or some other, uh, some footings as well being soil supported can be designed in the code without any reinforcement at all. Um, so you may could be used, but other plain concretes can be used in that same situation. One of the advantages with the uh, humane material is that we get very high strengths uh, as a consequence of the reaction that we're getting. And so when we have very high strengths, it makes, uh, it means that the, not the, just the compressive or the crushing strength, but also the tensile or the stretching strength is considerably higher. And where that's the case, we can build things that uh, things without reinforcement in them, pavements, um, uh, as I said, arch structures, uh, concrete floors that would not need any reinforcement in them whatsoever. Uh, and you can make them thinner. And the advantage of making them thinner, of course, is that you use considerably less material. Awesome. <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead, Richard. You can <laughs> knock yourself out. <laughs> okay. Here, here in Hilo, there's a portion of road that's made out of cement. Yeah, mm -hmm. so so it goes to the wharf and stops right there. Mm -hmm. And our experience in Hilo is, you know, as soon as you pave the road, it doesn't take very long before it starts to get bumpy and and it, you know and it starts to degrade and and it doesn't seem like it lasts very long at all. Now, when when I look at this cement. And, and it's not the same thing that you folks do, but it's cement, yeah? So, yeah, so concrete. Th that cement, I'm guessing, will last longer than the asphalt right next to it. And maybe your maze is, is similar to that cement or different? Or is... Yeah, one of the significant problems you have in, um, in the tropics is the amount of, uh, of sunlight that you have. And that uh, sunlight will degrade asphalt cement, 
which is the binder in asphalt concrete. And asphalt cement will degrade under ultraviolet light, and that starts to cause it to crack. But there's another um, issue, which is the, the, the different mechanisms in the materials. Asphalt or, or asphaltic concrete is a material that is flexible. It, um, it, it relies completely on the subgrade for support. Uh, concrete pavements are rigid. Uh, so as long as they're properly designed, they can bridge over softer areas. Now, you don't get to have the excitement that, uh, that we do here. Um, uh, in the mainland where they get a lot of frost in the winter. Uh, in fact, people run away to Hawaii to escape from that frost and a lot of, a lot of people looking to do that in January and February. And um, so, so you don't have quite those problems, but uh, flexible pavements are much more dependent on the soil conditions and the, um, the ultraviolet ages them quickly and they start to crack. Uh, concrete pavements won't have that uh, have that issue. They can be uh, more expensive to construct initially, uh, but if you look at a, a lifetime, and that, that's maybe what we should be spending more time doing, is look at what happens over a period of time that the concrete pavements uh, will pay themselves, will pay back the initial investment uh, uh, many times over by the fact that they don't need to be as repaired. They don't need to be repaired as frequently, and they certainly don't need to be replaced as quickly. I remember you said at the start, you didn't like to use the example of a sponge, but yes, but so water goes through this. Is that right? It, it can. Yeah. Most, uh, most sponges are, are the, the, the voids are not connected. So, um, but in, in the case of concrete, if, if we make it in a particular way, we'll have pores that are connected. So in other words, you could walk through void space, if you were sufficiently small, through void space from one side of the concrete to the other. Um, if we measure its permeability, uh, which is a, a measure of how easily water will flow under a given uh, pressure gradient. And in those cases, we see uh, water can move readily through the concrete. The way that we stop that is by densifying the concrete, is filling in those spaces so that we either have no connected space or that the path that is taken, instead of being a straight line, it's very circuitous, tortuous, so it takes time to, uh, to, for the water to move under a given amount of pressure. There's more back pressure. Um, there's a, a number of things that, that, that can be done, and it's, it's absolutely uh, uh, crucial for concrete durability to, to do your, what you, whatever you can to keep the water out. Awesome. And one of the things that I get most excited about is really the environmental impact um, and what we can achieve in that realm. So for the viewers who aren't as familiar with why concretes and cements are emissive in the first place and um, how we're looking at trying to solve some of the issues uh, around emissivity and greenhouse gas release, can you walk us through why traditional materials uh, and concretes are so emissive and what the big difference is here? Yeah, I, I, I'd be happy to, because this is a, um, this is one of the downsides or the detriments of using Portland cement, our particular binder. Portland cement is a, is a, is a material that is processed with heat. We, um, we start with some limestone and some clays or source of, and a source of iron, source of silica, and the first step that we take is we heat the material up, which takes energy and which is often associated with emissions. But the first chemical process that occurs is called calcination. And calcination is the process of taking limestone, which is calcium and a carbon and three oxygens, and driving off the carbon and two of the oxygens as CO2, leaving us with calcium oxide. So not only have we have we emitted uh, uh, carbon dioxide by burning fuel in order to get us to the temperature of calcination, which we'll have to go beyond, so there'll be more fuel, but we also have a chemical process that is converting limestone back into calcium oxide and car and carbon dioxide. And I say back into it because the the carbon cycle um, there's a process whereby a little bit of carbon dioxide is dissolved in the water and eventually precipitates down and becomes calcium carbonate. So we're reversing that process and we follow as 
we're very good at reversing the process much faster than the natural process is. And so we have a lot of carbon dioxide that's emitted from calcination and a lot more that is emitted from heating. And then when we're done, we end up with nodules, or ash or clinker of the burnt material in the size of say, uh, say uh, macadamia nuts. And then you would take those and grind them up. Macadamia nuts still with the shells on them or the uh, fruit on it. You grind those up into a fine powder and that takes a lot of energy as well. And so where that energy uh, is, is occurring, there's there are emissions. And so when we say uh, cement, we really mean Portland cement. Portland cement is, uh, is this material we're talking about. And we can add other materials um, to reduce the amount of Portland cement that we need and, and thereby reduce the emissions associated with it. But there are always uh, emissions associated with, uh, with the clinker. And so um, what we're looking to do is to have a concrete that does not use any clinker that uh, gets its uh, its grinding or its uh, hydratable material from other processes so that um, that you're able to reduce the emissions the, the difficulty um, and, and and often at this uh, point in an environmental discussion someone says well why don't we just get rid of concrete and um, it's a it's a good idea except uh, concrete uh, has a cost of cents a pound made to order delivered to your door there is no building material that uh, that we can replace volume of concrete we use as human beings on earth more concrete uh, than anything else other than water about um, three or four cubic yards per person on earth every year and we use it to make uh, lots of materials not not just pavements but the things that we don't see wastewater treatment plants water treatment plants um, uh, hospitals structures that define our modern life and so coming up and, and having a simple solution of well let's just not have concrete anymore it is not really a solution you'll never be able to replace it uh, with materials uh, with other construction materials and as a consequence we need to find ways of making concrete that has little or no or even better a net negative uh, quantity of emission yeah, and the major inputs in the system being waste, right? Um, yeah. And here in Hawaii, in Hilo, Hawaii, as we're looking at building it up to, uh, our major input is actually uh, the waste, the effluent coming out of the wastewater treatment facility center. So providing um, you know, a, a, a much needed solution to a problem that I think has been here for a very long period of time. So actually being able to process the sludges um, and the treated affluent coming out of some of the facilities that are currently being ejected out into Pukki Bay and actually uh, substituting that as uh, a main input into the system. So it's really a beautiful thing because, um, right, all of the inputs are waste, right? Every single part of it. We can do wastewater treatment processing. We can do solid processing, right, of the garbages that are uh, at the landfills traditionally. We can do seawater as the sea levels rise, and there's, you know, there's no additional inputs that are needed that are not waste streams, which is one of the really beautiful things of the systems and the technologies. And then, like Kevin's pointed out, the fact that we can do this in a way where we are replacing 100% of the Portland cement-based product, which is the part that is highly emissive, within the tech, you know, within the concrete product itself allows us to be net negative, which is really, really exciting because I think, yeah, Kevin's right on in saying there is not utilizing concrete isn't really an option right now in the way that we're functionally living uh, in society. So right now, the concrete being emissive is a detriment to us, right, in terms of environment and society. Yep. So finding a way to make the concrete part of the solution for carbon drawdown in a way where the carbon is being locked up or sequestered in a geological way, right? Because it's carbonated for um, millennia instead of it being utilized in a way that's re-released back into the environment, I just think is, it's just so circular and beautiful. Um, yeah, in a way I don't think we've seen before in the cement or concrete industry.
Yeah, and it, it's very much the the chemical engineering approach, which is we know which at what molecules we want, and we know what molecules we have, and so we need to run a process that allows us to take what we have and make what we want. And if we can do that by sourcing our molecules from waste streams that otherwise are going um, into landfills or, uh, you know, I hate to say it, up being dumped into the ocean, and then we are in uh, we're in very good shape. Uh, if we can continue those things, um, I always thought one of the nice things about the UMA process is one of the one of the byproducts is um, is potable water. It, it all depends on how you look at it, whether you think the concrete is the goal or potable water is the goal or whatever. But uh, mm -hmm. from our my concrete chair, it's nice to see potable water, uh, of which there is not an awful lot, as being one of the waste products. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can can I? You know, to get this straight in my mind. In, in, in other words, the process you're using, your maze using, results in less greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere and affecting the climate. Is is that fair to say compared to Portland cement or other yeah. ways of making concrete? Absolutely, that is exactly what the case is. Is that the uh, material? Uh, not uh, not by sequestration or anything else, but by simple avoidance um, of the uh, of clinker makes a significant contribution. If you look at other aspects of the production, you end up having fewer greenhouse gases or less quantity of greenhouse gas per or carbon dioxide in particular uh, at the end of the process than you did at the beginning of the process. And that's what net negative means is that it pulls carbon dioxide out of the system. And at the end of the day, it, it fixes it mineralogically. And in the same process that the earth has been doing for time immemorial, pulling carbon dioxide out of the, uh, out of the air and reacting it with calcium in the seawater to form limestone. It's pretty amazing. Why aren't we doing it right now? There's a, there's several reasons why, um, and, and this is where this is where the UMA process for me is absolutely fascinating, is that down at the concrete end, some of the waste byproducts, of waste products, however you want to describe it, of the manufacture of the um, of of among other things, potable water, is a material that currently and desalination is a brine that is put back into the ocean. Further processing of the brine results in an alkali type material that can be used to activate siliceous materials. So the reason it's not being done right now is because that alkali material is very expensive and it's also a very energy intensive to manufacture. Uh, but because it comes out as a waste process, a waste product of the UMA process, it's essentially um, without value, right? Something you probably have to pay to get rid of. And instead you take that material and you find another use for it. And this is uh, one of the, you know, my, uh, my uh, personal belief is that, you know, we've, we, I meet a lot of young people and my nieces and nephews among them and young people at the universities who think that the world is broken. And in fact, um, it, it is not broken. We just haven't sol solved the engineering problems that uh, our current situation presents. So we've had worse uh, engineering problems that we have solved as societies, uh, potable water and uh, safe drinking water being one of them, uh, highway safety being a prime example as well. We'll continue to, uh, to fix these problems so long as we um, apply our ingenuity so that we can solve the problems looking at not just what the problem is, but also the potential new problems that it may create. So I, I, I'm actually positive about uh, fixing many of the uh, challenges we have uh, facing us in society. And, and during the process, you make a uh, uh, large scales of hydrogen. Is that right? Just part of the process? Yeah. Yes. It's easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, right I'm now... talking too much. <laughs> Go to Richard, it's wonderful. I, I love it a lot. Um, yeah, we do. Uh, we produce right now between 11 and 12 tons of green hydrogen as a byproduct in the facility that's planned uh, for the Hilo side of the Big Island. So it's pretty substantial in the amount 
of hydrogen that's produced. Uh, and that's at qualities uh, that exceed what is needed for fuel cell utilization. So that's, you know, 99 point, it's over 99.99998% uh, pure. So that's fantastic. Set the right number of nine. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's, it's really nice too, even on the energy side of things, right? Because we get to produce something that can actually help make another sector greener, right? We're really focused on how to do the, the carbon drawdown, uh, right? And in the production of our concrete is where we're really sequestering our carbon dioxide, which is fantastic. But then we have these wonderful co-benefits in terms of the co-products that are produced, right? All of them being a valuable product and not having a stream of our own that's produced, I think is really one of the very exciting uh, parts of the system uh, solution. And right, hydrogen helps uh, clean up uh, the energy sector, right, as a sustainable alternative to some fossil fuels, right? It's an energy storage mechanism. Um, and then we have our water, um, which we have our potable water as an output of the system, which is really exciting as well because by right, drinking water um, and need for that globally is an issue. And then we actually have our biochar, which is another carbon sink for us, where we keep our right our high grade carbons that need to be introduced back into agriculture. Um, and then we have our concrete, right? Which is like Kevin was saying, the most utilized man-made material on the planet. So um, it it's a cross-subsidized approach where all the waste coming in gets to feed green solutions in different sectors. And that's one of my favorite parts about it. And the cement and concrete is a big, a big part of that. Amazing. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, I think we're just about um, out of time here. Were there any other uh, last minute questions or go backs that you had, Richard? Um. No, that's a lot to digest, but you know, the bottom line is pretty clear. You know, it's going to be good for the climate and we're going to use our waste. We don't have to bring it all in. We'll just use what's on the, on, on the island mm -hmm. for a solution that's lasting mm -hmm. longer, stronger. Holy smokes. Awesome. And, uh, it, it, uh, it, it's uh, to even, uh, even in the middle of it, it still seems uh, fascinating. Holy smokes is the right thing to say. <laughs> awesome well uh any any last minute uh go backs from you or anything else you wanted to uh, add in there uh kevin before we wrap up no other than um you know concrete is uh is a requirement for our modern and safe world in which we live and um we need to continue to find ways to provide it Without uh, without the large uh, emissions associated with uh, manufacture of Portland cement. Absolutely, and thank you, Kevin. I know that a large portion of your career, you're one of the leading experts in the world in looking at how to yeah how to decarbonize yeah the cement and concrete industry. So thank you for everything that you've done uh, in that sector and everything you continue to do. Um, and, well, thank uh, you for the opportunity to talk to people about it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. We loved having you on. Yeah. Um, yep, yeah. yeah. Agreed. All right, yeah, this is Inventing Our Future on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you so much, Dr. Kevin McDonald, for joining us today. Uh, and thank you to you, our viewers, for watching. Uh, if you want to get on our email advisories um, to see a complete listing of all of our shows, you can sign up for them on thinktechhawaii.com. We will be back in two weeks, so please turn in to do a deep dive into our the invention. We will dive into the invention this time. But until then, uh, I'm Brittany Zimmer. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.